Hello everyone and welcome to a new MCAS species guide. Today we're going to be talking about uh, two species, uh, Tapinoma nigerimum and Tapinoma erraticum. Before we get to those species, I'm going to be talking about something which is that I created a Patreon for people that like my videos for my subscribers. If you want, if they want to, if you want to, to support me. Now, I'm going to be talking about it for a little bit, but if you want to skip to the ant care species guide and the actual stuff about the ant species, go to this timestamp here, okay? And you'll hear no talk about the Patreon. So, here's the thing, I created the Patreon because I thought that, you know, I want to grow the channel and the community, and to do that, I need to make more impressive videos. That's just, you know, a simple fact. I do do a lot of these end care species guides, which technically don't take any sort of investment to make, except, you know, the camera that I use and all, and all that, that I could film with my phone anyway. So, the thing about them is that I share knowledge, which is something that doesn't cost any any money, any or very little money to make. It's something that I, I would get myself for my enjoyment. My ants are also something that I would get for my enjoyment. But if I had the means to create more impressive content when it comes to the ants, I would. And that would be better. It could create a better community, it could create a bigger community. So that's the reasoning behind the Patreon, because whatever money I get from there, is going to be invested directly into bigger and better setups and colonies and all that so that I can have something more to show. It's just, it's a way for whatever, if you want to, to support me. It's not something that I would say is in any way obligatory because there'll be no shortage of videos that I do on the channel because of me creating content for patrons. I will not be creating this... Uh, well-produced video content for uh, a price. I want to do this for free for YouTube. But if you want to, what I'll offer is the Patreon has a lot of tiers, right? I, I've created three tiers based on you know species that I like, which I think it's quite fun. And basically, since the first tier, you get access to all the posts. All I'll, all I'll make in, in Patreon are posts, little videos, pictures, texts, where I'll interact with you and show you sort of the behind the scenes of my videos. I'll show you more of my ant collection, my ant colonies, and all the animals that I keep. I'll also show you, you know, progress on the videos that I'm working on, what I'm doing, and everything behind the scenes of the channel, and also behind the scenes of my pets. I'll also, as the community grows, use that community to interact with a few of you and have you make decisions in sort of polls and questionings and posts like that where I, you know, I gave you, give you the choice for stuff about my ants. I'll also do that on YouTube, if possible, with the whole community. But I want to do some stuff like naming and all that to be with patrons, because I think that's a way that doesn't take away from the, the community here on YouTube and allows me to have that community on Patreon. Now, the tiers... Uh, mostly for, you know, posts and polls that I'll do for higher tiers, but mostly the tiers are only there for you to support me with more if you feel like it. It's completely up to you. So I ask you if you want to become my patron, which is something weird to say, but uh, I think I'll get used to it eventually, I guess. So thank you for listening. I'll go more in depth if I need to in a separate video, but I don't think there's no, I don't think there's a need for that. If there is, I will. So... Let's get back to ants. So, Tapinoma nigerinum and Tapinoma erraticum. These are both species that are mostly European and that are of the same genus. They are quite, you know, similar to the keep and they are spread out through mostly the same places. Let me run you through that. Here's a map from um, Ant Maps, which is a great website. You should, you should check them out, as I am now starting to do with my Ant Species Guides. Now, Tapinoma Tapinoma nigerinum exists in a more, you know, short range. They exist in the Iberic Peninsula, that's Portugal and Spain. They also exist in France and Italy, and they are invasive in some other parts of the world. As you can see, the red is invasive, yellow is inconclusive. So take into account the red ones if you think, if you're thinking like, well, do they exist in my country? The red ones, yes, the yellow ones, probably not, but maybe. The green ones definitely, and they're native there, so they're all fine where you live. Now, 
Papillome racticum has a much wider range. It, uh, it expands throughout all the Central and South Europe and all the center of Asia, as you can see here on the map. They are also maybe invasive in some places around the world. And if you live in the, in the area of Lisbon, you see them quite a lot. I don't live exactly in the capital of my country, but I live on the surroundings. And all this area around Lisbon uh, is filled with them. And, you can, and if you know ants and if you care about ants, you'll see them quite a lot. And they seem to have quite the invasive mindset. They are everywhere. I don't exactly know which of them I see because they're very hard to distinguish, but it's one of them. <laughs> now let's talk about, you know, climates. They live in mostly temperate areas, so they do hibernate, and when it comes to climate, the humidity that they need should be between 30% and 70%. Mostly you want to keep any pet at above 50% because that's how you live well, so you want to keep the, the outside nest at about 50% humidity, which is mostly what you'll have in your house, and you want to keep the nest slightly more humid than that, and in this, these two species, slightly maybe an, under, an understatement, because they really do well with a little bit more humidity than most temperate species from this, from this area, especially that's what I find for the Papinomus here in Portugal. When it comes to temperatures, they both can withstand anywhere between 18 and 28 degrees Celsius, they do thrive better between 20 and 25, though I do find that the ones that I catch here in this area of the world are more suited to a slightly higher temperatures than that, so I keep them at 25, 26, and they seem to thrive very, very well at that exact temperature. As always, give them a gradient, and if you don't know how to do that for either humidity or temperature, I'll leave a link down below where I explain how you can have your ants thermo and hydroregulate for you instead of you having to do it for them, which makes ant keeping a lot easier than trying to achieve certain numbers of humidity and temperature. It's also a lot healthier on ants. Now both of these ant species will live and thrive at those temperatures, though to be completely honest, Papinoma erraticum is a spec for more colder climates, though they do withstand the hotter climates just as well. They are more all-rounded when it comes to their temperature handling ability. So, anyway, if you keep them at those thresholds, they will both thrive extremely well. They grow quite fast and they are not that small. When it comes to hibernation, they have different times for hibernating, though this changes from region to region, whatever the climate that year is, because climates of the year are getting a lot uh, weird in the last few years. It's very messed up and you can notice that in nuptial flights and hibernation of ants if in your local neighborhood, if you live in a temperate climate. So, Capinoma erraticum hibernates from October to March, and Papinoma nigerimum, nigerimum hibernates from December to February. They both hibernate between 5 and 10 degrees Celsius, so if you want to hibernate them, that's the temperature threshold that you want to aim for. When keeping them don't go any lower than 5, they will die. Don't go any above than 10, they will wake up. When it comes to sizes, they differ slightly. Tapinoma nigerimum is slightly bigger. Their workers can measure from 3 to 5 millimeters long, and they, their queens can measure from 5 to 6 millimeters long. Tapinoma erraticum can measure 2 to 4 millimeters, the workers and the queens can measure from 4 to 5 millimeters. So Tapinoma erraticum is slightly, just a millimeter smaller in uh, average. They are both monogenous and polygenous, which means that you can have colonies with a single queen and colonies with many queens. Especially Tapinoma erraticum, which happens to translate to how prolific they are in their range, they are more polygenous. They have a bigger tendency to have a polygenous colony, and those polygenous colonies have a big tendency to have many, many queens. Now, Tapinoma nigerinum can also be polygenous or monogenous, though they don't have the same extremely high tendency to polygyny. Now, speaking of these queens and polygyny monogyny, I have caught a few queens which I think are of these, at least one of these species. I have kept a few of them together and they have started colonies together. Because you can see in this little footage, I have a few of them 
not all of these are papilloma, but the ones I'm showing you, most, most of them are. I have them sort of separated by genera, or by what I think the genera are, and species if I can uh, discern it. So here you can see all of them have laid eggs by now, and even the ones that are together, they have collectively made a pile. So I think we'll have a couple of these colonies, and I'll keep the one that's doing the best. Hopefully, it will be the one with the two queens. And if instead, maybe, instead of sending the other ones away, I can try to merge them together when they are small. If that doesn't seem to work, I'll throw them out, or maybe this is one of those uh, decisions that I'll make with you guys, either here on YouTube or on Patreon. Decisions that are more, you know, about the colonies themselves and what I'm actually going to do, more important stuff will happen here with the bigger community, stuff that's more, you know, niche and uh, cool and small, uh, that is, you know, important, like names, maybe it creates banners for the colonies and small decisions, like um, not what type of setup to have, but exactly how to have that setup, stuff like that I would like to do with a community on Patreon. So anyway, forget that. Here's the thing, they are quite cool and you can catch them. Uh, for example, in Portugal, in the, the great area of Lisbon, which is where I happen to live. If you live here, well, we've missed your chance by now, but next year. So when it comes to colony numbers, they can get up to a few thousand, not 10,000, but a few good thousand. Depending on how many queens the colony has and how, how well it's doing, it can get to six, 7,000. In the wild, they can get to the 10,000, maybe a little beyond that. It's a very hard colony to count because they create a lot of satellite nests in the wild. In captivity, they're a, they, they create big colonies which, you know, they're not big ants, so they don't occupy that an ungodly amount of space, like some other ants will, but they are still quite uh, capable of big uh, and very prolific growth. When it comes to feeding, these ants are very omnivorous, and from what I find, from what I've kept and observed in my garden, they are extremely prone to tending to aphids and collecting pollen from flowers which they eat. This is cool, I guess. This is one of the species that I get to observe in the wild the most because they exist all around my area and in the gardens near me. So they are very, very cool. I think the queens that I caught are of that species. I'm not sure because I know the workers are, the workers I see around here, and I think the queens are, but because I'm trying to identify queens, I'm not sure. We'll have to see exactly what, which species it is once the workers are closed, especially once the second generation are closes. Now, other than eating these types of sweets, they are very, very omnivorous. I've also kept them in captivity. And they, though they have a taste for insects and other types of protein, they have really a sweet tooth. They, a sweet tooth. They love sweets like honey and sugar water. They also love fruits. However, you can't forget to give them their protein because they are very rapid growers which means that they need their proteins to develop the eggs and the larvae and thrive and grow quickly. When it comes to behavior, they are quite a cool species. They are quite aggressive, but they aren't capable of doing too much damage to a human. They have formic acid and are prolific uses of it, which means that they are great at small level chemical warfare with other ant species and other insects, things of their size. With you, they'd have to bite into your skin and get to some sort of flesh or slightly deep into the dermis to actually be able to inject, to place the formic acid on you and hurt you. This won't happen unless you fall asleep with your hand in the reclosion or something like that, because they are not capable of breaking your skin unless you let them try for a long time, which I have tried when I was younger. That's how I know they can actually do it and actually hurt you after a while. It was weird, I didn't understand it at the time, but now, I can look back on it and, yeah, I, I get what, what was going on. They chewed enough to where that their formic acid would work. So they are very clean because they use these, this formic acid to clean the, the space where they live. And they can also fight a lot of uh, powerhouses, like, for example, the invasive Argentine ants. There are no Argentine ants in my area. And according to a few studies that I found about, about the south east of Spain, it is probably because of Tapinoma. That is quite cool, and it, this means that they are very, um, very active in your setup, which means that you have a great time watching them. They are not big, so observation with the naked eye 
isn't perfect, especially with the eggs and the nest, but they are big enough to where you can. You just have to get a little bit closer, but it's amazing to watch them. They, um, they are great and very active and are not that fast, but they are very, very active. So if you can keep them, which for me is quite simple, and for most people I think it is because they're very prolific in the wild, you should keep them. They are amazing. They can, they can live in any sort of setup. They are quite good at climbing, surprisingly. I mostly don't see them climb in the wild, but turns out they are kind of good. So good escape prevention is required, but it's not something that if you keep other types of ants, most good climbers are better climbers than that. So if you have experience with that, that will be no problem. So you don't have experience with that because this is quite a good uh, beginner species. Just know that you'll have to use a good barrier. And if you have a vertical upside down barrier, there's no way they escape. They're also very small, so there's no way that they reach over any barrier unless you make it very, very tiny. So keep that in mind. They are amazing pets. Thank you for all the support. Subscribe, like this video, leave a comment down below telling me if you have these species, if you've kept them or if you want to keep them, tell me all about it. I'd love to hear it. As you probably know, I read and answer most, if not all, of the comments on my channel because it, it is still quite small. So, I'll see you in the next one and bye-bye.